Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about participation and incentive compatibility constraints when a firm engages in menu pricing. And let's just say as an example for this video, we just have kind of two different types of consumer. We have a high demand consumer and a low demand consumer. Well, our menu can have two options then. We'll have one low quality option and we'll design that for our low demand consumer. This will be a cheap option and one high quality option that we design for the high demand consumer that will be a more expensive option. The problem is how are we going to price these options such that the high demand consumer really does choose that high quality option and the low demand consumer really does choose the low quality option. And actually there happens to be kind of four conditions that our menu must meet in order to make sure that we get it right, that our customers sort themselves in, in the right way, the way we want them to. And just to start, let's think first about the price of the low quality option. Well, we want to sell this option to the low demand consumer. So at the least, we must make sure that the price of that low quality option must be less than or equal to the willingness to pay of that low demand consumer for that low quality option. Likewise, we want that high quality option to be bought by the high demand consumer. So we want at the least just to make sure that the price of that high quality option, it's PHQ, is less than or equal to the willingness to pay of the high demand consumer, subscript H, for the high quality option. So these two constraints basically just make sure that the options will be cheap enough so that our consumers can buy the options that are designed for them. So that's what we call participation constraints, sometimes called reservation constraints. Now the next two conditions will be our incentive compatibility constraints. And this is just going to make sure that our consumer types select into those options that are designed for them by the firm. So making sure that our low demand consumer chooses low quality option, and the high demand consumer chooses the high quality option. And if we just think about that low demand consumer first, well, we just have to make sure that the low demand consumer is happier, for lack of a better word, buying and consuming that low quality option than they would be if they bought the high quality option. So in economic speak, we're going to make sure that the consumer surplus that the low demand consumer gets from the low quality option is greater than or equal to the consumer surplus that they would get from the high quality option. Now we can break this down since consumer surplus is equal to willingness to pay minus the price. So this condition here reduces to, so it will be the willingness to pay of the low demand consumer for the low quality package minus the price of the low quality package. And this must be greater than or equal to willingness to pay of the low demand consumer for the high quality package minus the price of that high quality package. Okay. We're going to have a similar condition for the high demand consumer. We need to make sure that, you know, the consumer surplus that that consumer gets from the high quality package is greater than or equal to the consumer surplus that they get from the low quality package. And we can break down this condition in a similar way as to before. So the willingness to pay of the high demand consumer for the high quality package minus the price of the high quality package must be greater than or equal to the willingness to pay of the high demand consumer for the low quality package minus the price of the low quality package. And so these third and fourth conditions, and I'll just remove the kind of consumer surplus uh, iterations of these because we don't kind of need them, are what we call incentive compatibility constraints. And if they're fulfilled, it means that our consumer's behavior will be in line with what the firm wants. So we have in total then four conditions that we need to fulfill if we want to construct our menu in the right way. Now you might have noticed that the inequalities are not strict. So I've included the point of equality. So it's a really good observation and I will address this, but I'll address it at the end of the video. Uh, so after I talk about profit maximization and, and the idea of profit maximization, given these conditions is something like, well, if we have information on the willingness to pay from our different consumer types for the different options, these four conditions are potentially satisfied by a range of prices. What we want though, is to isolate just the price solutions that give the firm the maximum amount of profit, right? Now, before I get to this, I am going to add an assumption. We're going to assume that if a consumer is indifferent between two options, two outcomes, that they choose the option that's designed for them. And this assumption is important because it happens to be the fact that the profit maximizing price solutions are at points of equality, which is technically when a consumer is indifferent between two options. 
So for profit maximization, we actually need this first condition to be an equality. So we set the price of the low quality bundle to be equal to the willingness to pay of the low demand consumer for that bundle. And we do the same thing with the fourth condition. So this will also be an equality. And this basically just means that the consumer surplus of the high demand consumer for the high quality option will be equal to the consumer surplus of the high demand consumer for the low quality option. And this is all a bit abstract. So just let's think about an example to demonstrate. So I have a table here which shows the willingness to pay for the low demand consumer and a high demand consumer across two options. We have a low quality option and a high quality option. Now just thinking about this first equality, in order to profit maximize, we're going to first set the price of the low quality option equal to the willingness to pay of the low demand consumer for that option, which is 30. You can see the willingness to pay from that low demand consumer for the low quality option is 30. Now at this price, the low demand consumer is technically indifferent between purchasing that option and not purchasing anything because they get exactly zero consumer surplus in either case. But I'm just going to invoke my assumption down here, even though they're indifferent between these two outcomes, I'm going to assume that they're going to choose to buy the low quality option because that's the option that's designed for them. Once we've fixed the price of the low quality option, we're going to think about that second equality condition that I mentioned, that we're going to set the consumer surplus for the high demand consumer for buying either option kind of equal to one another. And well, this comes down to the question of, what is the highest price that we can charge for the high quality option given the price of the low quality option? Well, the high demand consumer will get a surplus of, well, $10 if they buy the low quality option. And this is because we can see from the table, they value that low quality option at 40, but we've set the price of that option at 30. 40 minus 30 is equal to 10. That would be their consumer surplus if they got that. What we need to do in order to incentivize them to actually choose the high quality option and not the low is give that amount of surplus uh, if they bought the high quality option, right? So we need to match the consumer surplus. And if we have a look again at our figures, we can kind of deduce that that price will be 50. The willingness to pay of the high demand consumer for the high quality option is 60. If we want to make sure that that consumer gets $10 of, of surplus if they buy that option, uh, we need to price that will 60 minus 10 is 50. Now at these prices, again, the high demand consumer is technically indifferent between the two options because they get the same amount of, of surplus in either case, but we're just going to again evoke our assumption down here, which helps us out. We're going to assume that they will choose the high quality option. Now, I, I promise I will address all, all of that about the equalities at, at the end. But before I get to that though, I have motivated finding that price of 50 quite intuitively. Uh, I will show you that we can work it out just with our equations here to get with that price. So working with that last condition here, we see that the willingness to pay of the high demand consumer for the high quality package is well 60 minus the price that we're looking for, the price of the high quality package, that should be equal to the willingness to pay of the high demand consumer for the low quality option, which is 40, minus the price of the low quality option, that's 30. Uh, solving for this, we get 60 minus the price will be equal to 10. So the price is 50. And so that's our profit maximization price solutions. We first price that low quality package uh, equal to the willingness to pay of the low demand consumer for that package. And then we basically just work out the price of the high quality package from there. Now I have promised some discussion throughout uh, about some of this stuff. So let's do all of that now. And the first question that you probably have is really about the profit maximizing solutions being at a point of indifference at the equality. And this is the reason why I've had to make this assumption that I wrote down here uh, about our consumers choosing those bundles and options that uh, are designed for them, right? And really the problem is it's just an artifact of how we're taking price. So we're taking price to be continuous in nature. And this meant that if we like drew a line representing all the possible prices, it would be a completely smooth line. There would be no jumps. And that's really what it means to be continuous. And this means itself that if we took any two prices along this line, there is actually an infinite number of prices between these two points. There's never any discrete jump. So in our example, for instance, we could argue the following. Look, the high demand consumer gets $10 worth of consumer surplus if they choose the low quality option. 
So we need to price that high quality option so that that's the preferred option for that high demand consumer so that they get more consumer surplus from that option than the low quality option. And well, perhaps we could uh, suggest a price of $49. This would give the high demand consumer $11 worth of surplus, right? 60 minus 49 is 11. And that would be great. 11 is greater than 10. So our high demand consumer would definitely prefer the high quality option at that price. But profit maximization, however, requires that we choose the highest possible price, right? And because price is continuous, we could price higher than $49. So perhaps we choose maybe $49.50. And in which case the high demand consumer would get $10.50 worth of surplus, right? If they buy the high quality option, which is still greater than 10. So they'll still choose that higher quality option. But that can't possibly be the profit maximization price because we, we could still go higher, right? We could choose $49.99. And this would be fine too. The consumer would self-select into that high quality option just like we want, but price in our model is continuous, so we could go even higher. So it can't be the profit maximizing price, right? And we could do this forever because price is taken to be continuous. So what we do is we take the logic to the limit and we just get $50 as the solution. This will give us what we call a closed solution to the problem. And that's really why the equality is the solution. It's just an artifact of the fact that we're taking price as a continuous variable. So sometimes I hear lecturers and teachers talk about this and they'll say something like, you know, you can price, you know, something marginally lower than 50, you know, and, and you can think about it like this. And this is a perfectly fine way to think about it. Um, I do know one textbook that makes this assumption, the same assumption that I've made, Gravel and Reese, I'll, I'll reference it to it below. And, and that's all fine. Uh, but I think it's important to understand why it's the case that we see the solutions for these sorts of problems being at the equality in textbooks. It's just an artifact of, of the modeling price as a continuous variable. Now, the second sort of question that you might have is, you know, I haven't really motivated the profit maximization outcomes. You know, I haven't motivated why it's the case that the equalities that I've said out of the four conditions that we take one and four to be equalities and, and, and we're done. Now, condition number four, you know, I just explained that I think that it's fairly intuitive that we do need to match up the consumer surplus for that high demand consumer across both types of, of options. Uh, but you might be asking, well, why is it the case that we have to price that low quality option equal to the willingness to pay for that low demand consumer for that option? So why does the low demand consumer have to have zero surplus? And to, to show why this is the profit maximization outcome, and that no other outcome is, let's just think about what happens if we didn't price like this, right? Maybe we can set a lower price. So let's think about the price of $29 for this low quality option. Well, in this case, the low demand consumer gets $1 worth of surplus and on face value, that seems fine. You know, in the prices that we suggested before, the high demand consumer got some surplus. So, so what's wrong with that? Uh, but you can see, well, immediately the firm will lose some additional revenue here and it's not like we can gain it anywhere else. And the reason why we can't gain it anywhere else, and in fact, it even gets worse, is because by pricing that low quality option $1 less, we give that discount not just to the low demand consumer, we give that to the high demand consumer as well, because they can also buy the low quality package. So in order to incentivize then that high high demand consumer to buy the high quality package, um, you know, we need to give a discount to that package as well. If we priced if we priced at $29, the low quality package, well, our high demand consumer would get $11 worth of surplus, right? So we would need to price our high quality package at, well, $49. Uh, when before we could charge $50 for it and we were, we were getting $30 from the low quality package. And essentially what's happening is that any surplus that we give to the low demand consumer, well, the high demand consumer gets it as well. So when we price so that the low demand consumer gets any surplus, we have to give that surplus to the high demand consumer um, through lowering the price of that high quality option. So the firm loses revenue when they do this. The profit maximization outcome is really when we charge as much as possible for that low quality option. And this means that unfortunately for that low demand consumer, we have to get them to pay as much as we possibly can get them to pay, which is at the equality. All right, that's it. Are you still here? 
that's a long video. I hope that it, it's okay. It's, a, it's kind of a complex of different things going on. I, I do hope that it helps though. Please like and subscribe if it did. And you can check out my channel uh, for my other videos if, if you did like this video. In any case, I hope you guys are keeping well and I uh, hope to see you next time.